So hello, everybody. Welcome to the Drupal NYC meetup on May 5th. Uh, good to have you here. Uh, so please feel free to have your camera on if you like, but uh, not required. Uh, mute yourself if you're not speaking. Uh, that'll help make sure that there aren't strange sounds on the uh, recording and for everybody else. And uh, please don't use the text chat in Zoom. We like to use uh, Slack, Drupal NYC Slack uh, during our meetups um, so that we can continue those conversations uh, after and not interrupt the speakers. Um, and for that, we have the meetup channel uh, in Drupal NYC Slack. You can go to drupalnyc.org slash Slack uh, to get on there. So tonight we have a little bit of a different agenda than normal. Same, same, but different. <clears throat> uh, we don't have any big uh, kind of big talks uh, today, but I know we've got a couple of lightning talks. Uh, we're going to do introductions, uh, have a bit of a job fair for anybody who's uh, looking to hire or uh, looking to be hired. Uh, then we're going to have a little time to uh, ask questions of each other and uh, try to solve some of our Drupal or Drupal adjacent problems. And uh, then uh, dedicate a little time to brainstorming uh, what the future of DrupalNYC.org should be, um, and you know what we can what we can do do there. It needs help, uh, and then we have just general social time. Um, so that's the that's the agenda for tonight. Um, so get thinking about any lightning talk that you might want to give. Uh, it can be as short as you want or up to ten minutes long, and it can be on any topic. So today's meetup is organized by these fine people uh, based on the work of past organizers and the Drupal NYC board. And we would love you to get involved. Uh, David here has uh, volunteered. He's gonna be helping uh, coordinate our speakers. Um, so thank you, David. And uh, we, we welcome anybody else who, uh, who wants to, to do that uh, or help out in another way. Um, so you can connect on Twitter. Uh, we're at Drupal NYC. Uh, or we also mentioned DrupalNYC.org slash select. Uh, we always encourage everybody to join the Drupal Association. It doesn't cost much to do, and it's a great way to support uh, the nonprofit that uh, empowers a lot of the great things that happen in the Drupal community, including the Drupal project. Uh, so some other upcoming Drupal events. Uh, we've got uh, accessibility talks, broke with accessible taste, uh, the economics of access coming up on May, it's hiding behind my window here, 11th. Uh, we've got Drupal Diversity and Inclusion Camp, June 11 to 12. Uh, Drupal Camp Asheville, July 14 to 15. Decoupled Days, July 14 to 15. I'm not sure, those really the same weekend? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Could be. And uh, you can find a lot more events at drupal.org slash community slash events. Uh, speaking of other events, uh, one of our uh, regulars and a Drupal NYC volunteer, Amy June, uh, is providing a, or is running a talk. Uh, it's a speaker diversity workshop. Uh, and uh, this is through the San Francisco Drupal user group. And the idea is to help uh, speakers or prospective speakers from underrepresented groups uh, get prepared, feel comfortable speaking at conferences. Um, and so if, if you're interested, definitely check that out. That's May 26th, 3 to 5 p.m. Pacific. So that's 5 to 7 p.m. No, <laughs> that's 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern. Uh, another big event coming up, <laughs> Drupal Camp NYC 2021. Uh, so tentatively scheduled for October 28th to 30th, and we're planning on that being a hybrid in-person and online event. Um, and we have tentatively, uh, pending uh, government regulations and corporate regulations, uh, secured the 11 Times Square Microsoft Conference Center. It's a great venue. Um, so we're looking forward to that. And we would really like your help in organizing. Um, there are lots of different roles that you could fill, and they don't have to be large time commitment. Uh, and they don't require any technical knowledge, although technical skills are also welcome. So you can join camp-organize on Drupal NYC Slack or email camp-volunteer at drupalnyc.org. 
Uh, we have a new program, uh, the Drupal NYC Lunch and Learns, and they are the third Tuesday of every month at noon Eastern time. And great opportunity to learn something, uh, perhaps while the company is uh, paying you to be there. <laughs> Um, and we announce all these on our newsletter. So if you're not already getting our email newsletter, uh, be sure to hop on over to bit.ly uh, slash dnyc dash mailing dash lists. Uh, and you can also find that link on the meetup description for tonight. Uh, so we would love to have you volunteer to speak at an upcoming event, uh, including tonight, if you wanna have a, give a lightning talk, um, but in general, you can email speak at nyc.org and uh, David or, uh, or someone else will get back to you um, to, to schedule you and help you figure out what you want to talk about and how long it is and uh, all that good stuff. So if you are potentially interested, uh, definitely reach out. Uh, we would love to, to have you speak. Okay, so we'll move on to our kind of more program time and interactive time. So uh, time for introductions. There are not very many of us here, so it should be pretty quick. <laughs> um, I'll go first and I'll just let anybody uh, jump on who wants to. Uh, my name is J.D. Leonard. I'm a freelance Drupal developer uh, based in Jersey City, right next to New York City. And uh, let's see, what else could I say? And the module that I most recently interacted with was the SendGrid integration module, which I provided a patch for. Hey JD, I can go next. I, uh, I'm, my name's Jed, I, uh, I'm here in New York. I have worked on Drupal a long time. I'm a software engineer for a company called Linkwell Health uh, that does publishing in the healthcare industry. And uh, we just launched a new theme that's uh, rolling out to 20 plus sites uh, this week. So we're excited about that. I'm Scott Walpo, I'm based here in Queens or Actually, it's really in Long Island City, but we say Astoria. I have a small Drupal shop. We do a lot of work, workflow type things. And my my personal project, Opsid, is actually getting ready for soft launch. And one of our new potential clients asks us to play with the USPS address validation system. And so we're going to start playing with that. And when we're done, we will be able to have a listing of every pizza, pizza restaurant in the United States which is always a good thing to have. I can go. It's, um, I'm Jake Rockowitz. Uh, I'm in New York. I'm a Drupal developer for many years. Uh, I work for Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I have a blog. They're moving to Sitecore. I mean, I'm giving lots of details for people who don't know me, but you'll figure this all out. I'm the maintainer of the web form module. Probably if anyone wants me to talk about it, I will. I'm also doing a lot with Open Collective in the community. I can talk about that because it's more about sustainability of Drupal and contributed modules. And that's my introduction. Who wants to go next? I'm David, David J. Chen. I'm, I've been living in Peru for the last 10 years of my life. So I'm from Australia. Um, enjoying Drupal, work for a Christian mission organization, and we've got a few Drupal sites that I look after. Hi, I'm, I'm Michael uh, Racer, and I'm a newbie to, to Drupal. Well, I've been, use, I've been using Drupal 7 as a you know, developer, I suppose, or page maintainer for a few years. I do some HTML, but I don't, I'm trying to get into that CWA class whenever Doug starts it up. Segue, uh, Doug McCabe with the CWA Joint Training. Uh, we're also a uh, union web services affiliate contractor uh, to signatories with the CWA and uh, always looking to learn. Always a pleasure to, you know, see everybody here and see the group go. And we got uh, turned on to this group by Mr. Scott. So special shout out, Scott. And Doug, for, for those who don't know, the CWA is the Communication Workers of America. Correct. Yes. Communications Workers of America, about 700,000 members, I believe, nationwide, maybe a little more. And uh, we've been kind of steadily introducing uh, not only Drupal, but just some 
you know, kind of public technology oriented outcomes to the union over the last, really uh, going back now over a decade. So um, that's part of what we're up to. I've been indoctrinating them into the Drupal learning cliff. Okay, then I'll go next. Uh, I'm Ralph from Nuremberg, Germany. I'm in, in content strategy and you now for a few months or years trying to learn and understand Drupal. Hi, my name is Efrain. I am from Peru. Peru. Um, I am learning uh, Drupal right now. I work with David and I just start to learn something about Drupal. Awesome, welcome Efrain. Uh, anybody else want to introduce themselves? Going once, going twice. All right, we'll feel free to later. Um, so we'll move on to the next segment, which is who's hiring or who's looking to be hired. Um, so you can raise your hand or you can just unmute yourself and start start talking if you are hiring or looking to hire. I think Jed has a position that this company is hiring. I do. For. Yeah, we're hiring a, a, a director of data and measurement, I think is the post title. So somebody to really lead up that initiative um, and take it on, not just report building. We need somebody's like Google tag manager, you know, on steroids and uh, wants to come up with measurement plans and understand programs and, and many programs uh, in depth. Uh, but if that's you and you love data, come work with me. It'll be fun. There's a post in, the, there's a job post uh, channel in our Slack and I've got a link there uh, fairly recently. I could put it again, but I think you'll find it. Thanks, Jed. Anybody else hiring or looking to be hired? Um, I'm going to promote myself a little bit. In a, in a, um, I'm doing little consulting gigs for web forms on the side for anyone doing a project. And I, I mean, this is not a large group. It's really, I want to emphasize like what I found was lots of people doing weird things. And I'm trying to offer myself to help them stop doing those weird things in small minor engagements which i'm promoting and i actually have one on friday which i'm very excited about where it was great someone reached out to me and in 15 minutes we set up two two-hour calls to just be like what are you doing what's your plan for migrating from drupal 7 to 8 with web forms and how are you going to do it and i said you can record it you can pick my brain first round you know they tell me what's going on give me some problems maybe the second round we talk about it and I'm trying to work out that model. Maybe I'll talk more about it during the lightning talks, but I, I think I got to start promoting myself a little. It's one And my project would not exist without web forms. And that quick question, Jacob, can we do field sets and web forms? What, Scott? Field sets and web forms. What do you mean, supporting it? Yeah, does the field set support it? Well, we can take three or four items and, and put them into one set. Yeah. The, yep. In D8, it's all, there's a whole container system. So it's like an element that you can stack things in. But let's move on. I don't want to, we, we should stay focused on JD. I'm going to, I'm getting better at this and project, man, you know, like my role as a tech lead. Let's stay focused. Who else is hiring? And then we move on to the next. Thing. Love it, Jake. Anybody else hiring or looking for uh, a job or uh, their next gig? Maybe their next musical gig. Yeah, if you're if you're looking to hire a newbie who works hard and figures good at figuring things out, you know, the, the brute force method, I'm here. Nice. Okay, last chance for anyone else? Going once, going twice. All right. We will move on to what appears to be a duplicate slide. <laughs> Already did that. <clears throat> and okay, lightning talks. So I know I know of at least two people who uh, are interested in giving lightning talks. Um, and the, the floor is open. So 
anybody who wants to, to volunteer a topic or to uh, volunteer a selection of topics for the group to choose from, uh, you are more than welcome to. I mean, I'll talk about web forms where people have, like in the virtual world, what I've learned is you have to be willing to ask questions. I'm just not gonna spiel. You have to say, I've used web forms and I have this problem and I actually have a deck to solve problems. If you say, how do I do spam? I could probably answer that in a lightning talk. And that probably 10 minutes, if there's a small group, two or three people ask questions, I can answer it. Um, yeah, I'm open to it. And I think JD will talk about anything. I'm done. I like ending with that. Or you I'm do. Done. Well, you gotta punctuate. I, a funny thing is, uh, I was on a call with Lalba many years ago and they ended their all, everyone had to go ta-da at the end of their spiel so that it would move the call forward. And it's not a bad pattern. So you gotta have your, your catch words. So I'm done. Nice. <laughs> Anybody else interested in giving a lightning talk today? I mean, if we're doing web forms, I could, and I know I mentioned it last month, we could kind of show off what we're doing with web forms to CRM. I don't know if there's any interest in that, but if that's sort of the theme of the lightning talk, I'd be happy to do a quick demo. I don't know what you're looking for, but. Uh, yeah, you know, that sounds good. The, this yeah, lightning talk is just an opportunity for anybody to show off what they've been working on or uh, speak about a module or talk about uh, whatever, anything. <laughs> Anything I should goes. say for me, the challenge will be managing Zoom, but uh, you're, you're forewarned. <laughs> We're here for you. Anyone else? I think David has at least a light, one lightning talk. <laughs> you know, you know about my light, lightning talk. <laughs> um, so I would say. Jake, why don't we start with you? Let's start, uh, we can do a little Q and A for, for web form stuff. And uh, if we run out of questions, we'll move on to Doug, um, do a little demo about what he's been working on with web form and, uh, uh, right. and uh, then we can move on to David, um, who I think might, might give us a choice, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, I can do a little introduction. I'm gonna do a what's new and what I'm doing with web form is kind of different than what people would expect, but um, you should check out my blog. I'm gonna share my screen. So as I'm talking, I can just show things, say, hey, yeah, okay, uh, this will stop others from sharing. JD, I hope you don't mind me take, trying to take over. Please. Um, so this is important because I can't give you all this information. I have a website, jrockwoods.com, and my blog, I'm talking about, I've been doing web form for five years, as part of my, you know, support, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer, Kettering is my main client. I don't tend to mention it in my blog post, but they're moving away from Drupal to Cycle. Don't have control of that decision. That's, it's a classic scenario where a new CTO came in and said, I'm gonna wave my magic wand and say, everyone's doing something different. And between this small group, then he's like, I gotta go and found another job. <laughs> and the funny part is we can't change that, that train left the station and they're moving to Cycle. So I have to figure out how to make my contribution to Drupal sustainable. And I kind of feel like it's a general issue in the Drupal community. So since January, I've been blogging about it. I actually sometimes put, you know, sometimes I talk about it and then I put blog posts like this that create a lot of controversy and I get some bad feedback, but I basically am saying, I don't want to do this anymore for free. And I don't want you freeloaders expect me to do it for free. And I've changed my tone to be more positive. We should read this. But more important, I just, we could talk about it for a second, but I just want to be like, I've actually set up an open collect. Well, there's two parts of this. I am trying to basically say people should fund me and make it possible for me to help you. And I've redone the web form module project page. There's no other project page on Drupal.org that goes this far to be like, here's your option. Contribute code. I also, I like practicing this spiel. It helps me to say to people, ready? Get involved is one with my thinking Two, help fund development and open collective which is just making it possible for me to do an hour a day to help resolve issues and i'm really trying to set different goals my goal is to triage issues within 24 to 48 hours that means 
if anyone posts an issue in the web form issue queue, Open Collective will make it possible for me to spend 20 minutes, five to 20 minutes to be like, hey, here's your problem. And finally, just hire me for professional support. I'm not looking for a job. I'm looking to help people succeed in small engagements. Um, it's definitely targeted not for individuals, but organizations. And there's my spiel. Now, you can ask me anything about web form. JD, I hope you don't mind me doing a, it's a two-part lightning talk. I got to pitch my, myself and then be like, ask me anything. Um, I can if you don't mind if I can make a comment. Yes. I think Webform is one of these modules that every single Drupal developer in the world has heard of. So working in Australia, when we got started on, on Drupal, right from Drupal 6, and I've also been really impressed seeing what's new in, in, with Drupal, with Drupal, with Webform as time has progressed. So um, just a thank you. No problem. I am very impressed on what's going on in Australia. I was up at three in the morning with a, a actually not a developer, but kind of like the marketing guy for a company in Australia doing massive government websites. And Webform was just like just doing transparency for municipalities where they had built dashboards to show how they're spending money. And Webform was just a part of amazing custom code. I mean, basically, someone fills out a form and says, I spent money on this, and then they put it into this dashboard and track it. And yeah, Australia seems to be the government that's all in on Drupal. Like, that's it. They're, I think it's across, it just feels like it's across the whole country, which is amazing. Um, I mean, I can nudge you guys to ask questions. I just want, this is very funny. I did a presentation at DrupalCon. It is, um, you guys can still see my screen. It is a 138 slides. We are not doing 138 slides. But what I did is I made a modular, someone pointed out to me on Twitter, a modular presentation where you can ask me anything. And I have 24 different sections in this presentation where I could talk about spam to how forms work, to alternatives to the web form modules, to anything you want. I'm also fine to stop talking. So I think, I think our challenge is to try to stump Jake find something that's not in his uh, in his deck here that he can point to. Well, but then I have an instance of web forms running, so you can't really stop me. Okay. Anyway, sorry. Who did I cut off? I apologize. Well, Jake, I, I had something I, I'll pick your brain about, and I think it'll give you a chance to talk about maybe a feature of web forms that everybody doesn't know about. So, you know, I've mentioned we, we do a lot of uh, distribution and syndication of, of content. That's uh, what I work on. And so when we engage with the new client, it's like, how are we going to get the content to you? So we have, you know, REST endpoints, we have XML, we have RSS, we have Adam, everything you can imagine. But sometimes there's the, the want to just copy HTML or embed like a widget that would load the content on a site, maybe asynchronously. And so we've, we've worked on that and we've got something close, but it was one of the last times you spoke to this group, you had mentioned you could do that with web form. You said, you know, web form has this ability where you can embed a web form really anywhere on any web property. And I remember that and I told my team, I want to investigate how you're doing that with web form. And so I thought maybe you could talk about that. And then you could also talk about like, is that, code or, or did you lean on something that I could investigate and, and learn more about? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll demo the feature because everyone should be aware of it. it. It's very simple. So, you know, we, I do my demos over the contact form, very simple contact form. And if you go over to settings, I hope my demo site has this set up. I have, there's a web form share module. So it's a sub module. And if I go down here, oh, look at this, my demo. Here, form sharing, if you check it, by the way, this is a security concept is you don't want to share something, you want to make sure people select to share a web form. There's a way to go in and globally share all, share all your web forms, but I wanted to make sure people were making the decision each step of the way. I'm just sharing this contact form and I hit save and it'll add a tab to the top of the page called share. And I'll answer the question about how it gives you a code snippet. And you can embed this code snippet as JavaScript or an iframe on any site. And here's this special, amazing library, iframe resizer, and I'll pull it up in a second. And it also includes a, a preview tab. 
So the idea is that it's embedding and ready. This took a hiccup to load because I'm like loading a dynamic web form. It's really complex, but it allows you to embed a web form in any HTML page. If you were sharing content and you were using the iframe resizer and you had good caching, it would look seamless. So you could iframe in content from anywhere. And that library, let me see what the status is. Because when, So when I make these decisions to use a library, I try to research and look and see, is it supported? Like how long is the person still maintaining it? I can be wrong when I make my guess on which library is the best one. But this had the, the number of forks and stars was really high on GitHub. He made a commit nine days ago, which is pretty amazing. Um, this is a great library. So basically you just, the implementation detail is the iframe needs to have some JavaScript and your website needs to have some JavaScript to allow the cross domain scripting to happen because you're embedding your content in someone else's site. So in, in a lot of ways, putting JavaScript in both places is an agreement to resize content. It's an awesome, I, I love third party libraries where it takes an hour to implement. And you're like, I don't have to think about this. And you should buy this guy a cup of coffee. I wish they would say how many cups of coffee he has received, but they don't. I think, people, by the way, on my whole spiel and Open Collective is, it only works if you're as transparent as hell. You're gonna see in my blog post, I'm gonna just like invoice and list every single thing I did in the past month down to the minutia of five minutes so that you know what you're getting when you actually get involved. Anyway, I, I'm, did I, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's great. Yep. Any other questions? We can always come back to me. Yeah, Jacob, in relation to that, other than clicking to share this web form, is there any way we can make sure it's only shared on certain sites by IP address or domain name? Um, that's not implemented and I just don't know. I think you have to do some custom code on your server to to make that work and that would be a little dicey and you can't really do any like special tokens because it's all going to be passed through the client um so i i actually think once you say share anyone could embed it by the way that was why i did that security you know that and, check on that and i'm assuming though we can populate the fields from from any data source that we're using correct yeah and these forms when they're embedded there's a test let me see if this is working right it actually will pass. I'm not going to go through. Oh, this just test the form. But you can pass parameters through that third party. So if you were doing an event registration in the URL, you could say question mark, you know, question mark event name and pass it through to the web form. You all you have to configure these things. These are all just features in the web form module that you're kind of setting up when you're sharing. Um, I, I see myself actually using that pass, you know, the pre-populate. It, what is it? No, it's uh, yeah, pre-populate through the URL feature for shared forms. Yeah, I just need to figure a way to make sure that other people can't drop into their website and then and put the form information and use that form unless it's, you know, unless it's just getting information back. It can't be an entry yeah. form. It could be, you know, it could be where every field's pre-populated and they can't enter data. Like a search, yeah. it would be good for a search. Mm -hmm. But that's no, it's good. Tricky one. Yeah. All right. Hey, I spoke for 10 minutes. Let's move on. I've got a quick question for you, Jake. That is, sure. um, can you use Drupal's migrate API to migrate forms from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 or 9? Or do you need to use the export capability? Um, the, well, the, there's a web form migrate module. Uh, well, you know what? The best way to promote stuff like that is to go in here. So there's an add-on section. By the way, I'm do, that's going to be really clear. I'm practicing my self-promotion technique really hard right now. So I just released the new release of web form and I just finally sucked it up and I said, well, under the add-on sections, I'm going to promote myself, not promote myself, it's promote the triptych because it really is a third of hire me and the rest of it is help make this work. Anyway, that's why you're seeing this. This is brand new, but JD, to answer to your question, uh, oh God, what was your question again? Because now I <laughs> You're promoting yourself too well. Uh, the question is about um, migrating web forms. Oh, migrate. That's why I just needed to type the word migrate. There is a migration module 
and it is this the guy who is um maintaining it is i mean this was a collaboration it's been getting a decent amount of support look it was re last month two months ago they did a release so this will probably get you 80 percent there in migrating your web forms from um seven to eight or nine and the web form module supports importing so you could rebuild your web forms frankly i might do this some, for some cases if you rebuild your web forms there's a submission import so that you could basically rebuild it go to your old site export the data as a csv and then import it into your new site that's another workflow those are two options by the way if you're if you're coming from a site that's not drupal it's a great workflow you're going to have to build your form from scratch anyway and the key thing you want to do is get that data from the legacy, your old legacy system into Drupal. And that's what this utility does. Okay, JD, any other questions? You could stop me. This might be a, might be a, a very simple question, but um, can, we, can you save nodes through Webform? Save nodes? What do you mean? So if I've got uh, content coming in through Webform, can I create yep. a view to, um, to filter and and sort the, the data there yeah there is a web form views module and it the it basically uses the way web form data is stored which is like not typically it doesn't use field api it's called an entity attribute value model and you can create views from that i don't recommend that 100 percent to answer your question specifically there's a great module and i actually been recently talking to the maintainers a little bit it's called like the create content module and let me see if i can expand this and this thing yeah, the content creator. So when a submission comes in, it'll start generating node trees. And what I kind of recommend the workflow is if you have, like I've seen it over and over again, you have a form with 200 fields and you want to query 20 of them. If you use something like this, you could create that, like you could create those web form, those nodes and then do anything you want with them. So this is a great, and I, let's also just note, by the way, this is for people new to the community, but you want to always check the status of a module if it's well maintained and the most immediate key is looking at the date of the last release and if it's in the last year that's a good sign i you know what for new people i just want to point out in the last year it's a good sign that there was a release and you want to look at the stats and generally anything that has a few hundred is decent and then you look at this how many issues and frankly you peek at the maintainer and i forget you know, it's an active maintainer at a, at a regular job. So anyway, any other questions? I hope that answers it. Well, thank you. Yeah. All right, JD. Where's your, where's your, what's, where's your, uh, your catchphrase at the end? All done. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. I get to stop I'm done. My, I forget. My, my daughter's catchphrase is all done. She says, all, all done. done. Yeah. All done. Whatever she doesn't want to do, all done. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm going to stop sharing and hand it off to someone else. Doug, do you want to share what you did with uh, WebForn and City? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Can I can I segue? Do you know, like with Civi, have you worked with in Drupal 8 or 7? Uh, right now it's 7, Jake. Okay. Which is amazing because, well, Corinne is actively pushing the 8, but what they did is Cole. I forget his last name, built that seven integration, which is just amazing. So, okay. Hand yeah, it so, so we'll see if this all works in eight. Uh, yeah. And we'll see how the demo goes. I, the golden, early golden rule of tech demonstrations I learned is, uh, you know, the level of failure is directly proportional to the number of people on the call or in the room. So uh, we've got eight. I think our chances are pretty good. So, okay. um, let me just, um, you know, the way we look at this and the way WebForm has sort of worked its way into our um, workflow is in a, as part of, you know, four phases. The first phase being basically the data capture. We wanted a way to uh, essentially capture relationships between the various, uh, you know, entities, data objects, what have you, that uh, are... Uh, you know, representative of the individuals and organizations impacted by the form. Now, as you can see, we're on an electrician site. Uh, just a little bit of background about, you know, trade unions and kind of uh, anybody on the call ever actually been in one or, or familiar with one or grew up in a family with one? 
Doug, I've worked on IBUW48.com. Oh, okay. <laughs> Was that Jake as well? No, this is Jed. I, I used to live in Portland, Oregon. 48 oh, Jed. The local okay. out at, in, in Portland. Uh, and yeah, it was a, I, we uh, ran an agency out there back then, but they were a great client of ours. Yeah, I do know 48. I don't know yeah. them, you know, personally, but I, I definitely know the local and I've seen some good stuff online. So, oh, that's amazing. That's uh, yeah, good connection, Doug. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. What a coincidence. Uh, so, you know, they have this thing called portability. And portability, basically, I mean, everything with the trades is about, you know, market share. And so just from the UWS perspective, we're always trying to, you know, work backwards from the business outcome uh, because nobody, you know, they don't care about the bells and the, you know, so-called bells and whistles or whatever. I mean, we're trying to provide business outcomes and improve their marketability and the way they essentially, uh, uh, you know, the way the union at least would be a partner to, uh, along with their signatory contractors, which somewhat similar to what we do in the CWA uh, is to uh, provide the workforce, uh, you know, that works on these projects and even though they're union and perhaps the workforce is paid at a little higher rate, um, you know, the selling point of the union, the trade union is to say, well, you're getting more efficient workers, you're getting, you know, more accomplished tradespeople. And uh, uh, that means that, uh, you know, if you look at your you know, ratios and so forth, of apprentices to journeymen. I mean, without getting too deep into the weeds, that's that's the union role. But this this agreement that they have on so-called portability basically stipulates that uh, so as to not lose market share, they can have other signatory contractors come into their jurisdiction. So as you guys can see, we're, you know, working in, in Jacksonville. And, um, you know, this is, that's just kind of a, I guess, a restatement I did here of this actual agreement. Um, so they've got to basically check in. They've got to report uh, when they're doing the thing. So uh, maybe this helps us. Any outside firm doing electrical work within the jurisdiction shall be governed by the applicable portability, which is this. And uh, you must re-sign the portability form by the first of the subsequent months. Check all the fields. So we took these different entities um, out of CIVI. And the nice thing about that is you click here. And you can determine uh, the number. Now, the sequence actually matters here. So if you go into the city, you have to enable this. All the magic happens uh, by clicking that uh, checkbox, which I'm, I guess I'm sort of afraid to uncheck it, but I guess I'll do that. Okay, it came back. That's good. <laughs> and uh, the sequence matters. So the job reporter is the person who's basically saying, hey, I'm the you know, supervisor, let's say, who's, who's working for this organization who's working on this project and I'm reporting that I'm bringing, they can bring up to four people. And I guess this guy counts or, or girl count, you know, gal counts. Uh, so I'm bringing, you know, three other men and women into the jurisdiction and I'm affiliated with this local. So you've got all these relationships and rather than obviously, you know, one obvious uh, uh, selling point, I if you will, of uh, web form CIVI CRM is you don't have to create all these forms. And I'm, I'm sure Jake's, uh, web form probably does this as well, but you can just pull, you know, the fields right in. So first name, last name, you just select them, uh, their phone number, their email, et cetera, et cetera. And then it does capture, uh, you know, the, the, the phase two is really the logic. So you want this logic to match kind of the real world. And I think that's going to be more visible under contact to the contractor. Uh, so this address refers to contractor address and again you're enabling these here and um let me just see under the relationship where the heck is it share address so you can share the address so like the job reporter would potentially if you're loading a work address share the share the uh, location of the business and so this contractor would be the business now i thought i had a relationship active here. Okay, I guess we're not using that. We're just sharing the, well, it, it does create the relationship. So that's interesting. Now, maybe I, I'm a little out of sequence here. So maybe the relationship is here. Oh, current employer is the contractor. Okay, so that's referencing this. Sorry, not to, when we, you know, we stare at this all the time. So I'm probably uh, glossing over some important points here. But anyway, uh, so the project is actually a, a different type of, um, and we wrestle with this, and I don't want to go again too deep into the weeds, but I it's sort of a, a contact subtype um, out of the CIVI database. So the project is really kind of like an organization, but 
a little customized because if you think of a construction project, it's going to have all these multiple entities, you know, working in the skyscraper, you'll have different trades, you'll have different contractors representing those trades, different trades, men and women uh, working for the contractor. So the relationships really matter all that to say. Um, and let's see, and these electricians are just people that this person who may be one of those people, by the way, um, is then listed on the form. Uh, so I think that's phase two, the logic. Um, so let's see it in action. I'll just try to get something going. We do everything kind of this. Uh, let me give these test numbers here. Uh, and maybe I'll do something like that. And uh, you can see my fields are getting a little crazy. We probably don't need that second email. Does need perhaps a little tweaking. We just went live with this. So, uh, are you a member? So yes. Uh, then they would give their card number. Whoops, a lot of which can just be their same last name as we run this test. Supervisor or foreman. These are conditional. Uh, probably nothing terribly new here. Uh, we do like this. Are you registering other electricians? So that custom field set uh, or, or or set of uh, uh, those entities, let's say, don't oh, don't load. We made that conditional, unless you click that. So I thought that was kind of cool. Yes, electrician one, and then you input the person. So um, we say electrician, oops, uh, and we'll say um, uh, no. Let's see if we've got an actual. Uh, okay, maybe she's in Jacksonville or something. Uh, and, uh, just stop me if this is like watching paint dry. <laughs> so give me a second here. Uh, okay, she's Mary Electrician, so maybe we'll give her an actual email as well. Just for the sake of uh, brevity and uh, moving on, I'm going to leave it at just reporting one, but they would obviously, they could do this with one, two, or three. Uh, let's say, okay, they came from local three. Now that tick list is something we like because this can also reference different uh, groups and different data in, in the uh, database. You can see all that. So if they're associated with local three in Queens, submit that. Um, you don't have to necessarily have the phone number. And let's see. Um, now, we, we probably want to say what contract we're working for, but not, that action looks a little weird, kind of bouncing around. But let's say um, she works for Mary Electric Gold. We should, it's going to say create new, which is very important that that works correctly. And uh, maybe her uh, firm is, uh, I don't know, located in Massachusetts. Whoops. What did I do there? Oh boy, that was the danger, wasn't it? Okay. Here we go. Okay. So she, the firms in Watertown. It's just the forms, guys, that are giving me a little bit of trouble here. All these pretty fields. Okay. And then, uh, so so they're working on a project. Well, what project? Well, if they're working on a Burger King, I mean, there could be several. Of them, so they're going to want to identify. And this is, you know, same thing in Salesforce. I should say. I mean, uh, you've really got to do this uh, nominal. Uh, uh, you know, name, naming of the project kind of right in, um, right in the title name, because this is going to be the entity that actually goes in the city that you're ultimately going to end up uh, searching and mapping. Um, so I don't know. I mean, if we say create new, maybe we say Burger King and you will four. Again, I'm just being real simple. And, um, and then you could put in Let's just grab one. So, Doug, what happens when you submit the form? What when I <laughs> right? Yeah, let's do that. I was just going to get an actual address. I'm sorry, I, I will wrap it up. I, I, it's my first time kind of presenting this. As long as the email goes out, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get it down a little bit. Yeah, sorry guys, I'll get. I will get it. Uh, let's see. So we are going to submit it. I just I, I, the, the 
fun part is kind of seeing all this uh, data, I think. So, okay, so here. So JD says what happens when we see it. Okay, so we've got the electrician. Uh, we've got the contractor. We've got uh, the reporter. Okay, so let's try to just keep, I guess this matters in a way because this is going to be the result. So, okay, so let's get down and let's see if this works. Uh, let's submit it. Let's see what happens. And, uh, well, we're logging everything. So, Scott, there you go. Proof that this actually fired, I think. Uh, okay. I didn't realize logging everything on our SMTP authentication. Anyway, that was just for the email. So, uh, you got that. You got the results in there. Now, if you go into Civi, uh, let's just take a look. And this will be the end of the demonstration, hopefully, if everything works. Um, we're having a little bit of trouble with this. Uh... Oh, no, it's working. Okay, so Mary Electrical should now be contracted. Uh, it should be in there. And there's the electrician. And now we're just going to check these relationships. And so Mary Electrical, yeah, she's the contractor on the, on the Burger King at Uli. And she's the employer. Uh, the contractor is the employer of this person and also the employer of uh, Mary Electrician. Uh, so... You know, part three is really retrieving all this, right? And I, I won't obviously. Don't, don't worry, I'm not going to go through that. But um, that's what that's what you want. You want to go in and say, well, how many uh, you know electricians worked for such and such contractor is defined by the relationship of the firm within a certain geographical jurisdiction. And phase phase four, you know, would just be the mapping and the visualization of this data. Uh, so that's how we see web form fitting in. But obviously, city is a big a big piece of that. So done. Thought that might be uh, cute to show the uh, relationships as well, and that's all retrievable. I mean, I could do that if anybody wants to. Cool, thanks, Doug. What uh, what's the I guess what's the business need uh, for this? Like, what I guess what, what do you do when you retrieve it? What do you retrieve, and why why does the organization need that you information? Know, you're, you're measuring. You know, you're always going to work back. Uh, technology from whatever the business result is. In this case, the business result is, you know, they all have to be defined, right? So you're going to define success as increasing the number of electrical hours, you know, uh, annually performed by your members and your signatory contractors. Uh, so this would allow you to, to map that, the more people that are inputting. Now, it doesn't have to be restricted. This is kind of a, if you will, legalistic thing. It doesn't have to be restricted to you know, that it could certainly be if you just get enough of the data captured, and there'd be a variety of ways to do that. Uh, and a lot of the developments is in, in you know, data mining and stuff. I mean, there's a lot of potential there, but I mean, we see Civi is kind of indispensable to storing it, housing it, you know, retrieval, mapping it. Uh, and then you're looking at metrics, right? So if you want to get into, you know, not to keep going here, but like visualization, you know, kind of capturing this stuff. You know, we do some stuff on that too, but that's the business need. You're measuring the number of hours and how close you come to increasing because they have very specific national goals. And, you know, you do that well enough, you get the president shouting you out in his first state of the union address. So there is a business need. Cool. Uh, anybody else have questions for Doug? Awesome. That's great. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, very cool. Okay. Thanks for sharing, Doug. Okay, so David, you are you are up. Cool. Let me share my screen. So regular expressions. Uh, just quite recently, my wife, who's doing her master's in public health was writing this essay and she had this challenge where um, the, the software that she's using, um, um, okay, during, in, in the middle of her essays, she's got this text that is a citation. And when she hands the citation, when she hands this, the essay in, she wants to do a word count without these citations. So, and all these citations have a common pattern. 
if you can, here are, are a couple of examples. And I thought this is the perfect example to use regular expressions. So I'm sure we've all seen regular expressions in, in code, and I think we've got an advanced group of people here. So I think at the end of this, I might give a few, a few of you guys, a few volunteers, uh, a test with some simple regular expressions. Um, so regular expressions are a string that will help us. So let me look at the definition of a regular expression. So it's a, a regular expression or a regex is a string of text that allows you to create a pattern to match, locate, or to manage or change text. They're really useful in validation. Um, recently, we had a project where I had to get a Drupal app out very quickly, and we had people registering. And after we had about 3,000 registrations, we realized there was problems with the data, and we had to kick off a project to clean the data. And if I got things right with some using some regular expressions, I could have avoided some of the problems that we had. So could I just get a show of hands? Who feels, who's seen regular expressions before and who, um, two hands if you feel very comfortable with regular expressions. One hand for you've used them, two if you, oh, of course. <laughs> so this is a very short talk um, where I want to give a few examples. So regular expressions allow you to do validations to match strings in in a very concise way. So for example, let's have a look at some, num some actual numbers. Let me open an example here. So I've got a few different types of data here. I've got some phone numbers. This is a Peruvian phone number. Um, this I'm guessing is a US phone number. I've got two email addresses and I've got some text. So let me create a really simple regular expression to match our Peruvian phone number here. So if we look at a, a little cheat sheet, this is a website that I've used many times and I find very useful. I'll just bring this across. I'll give you a, a link to this if if that's useful at the end. So in our phone number, we've got digits and we've got spaces. And so do I have a volunteer who will give a go trying to match this, this phone number? If I don't get a volunteer, I'm gonna volunteer someone. This is the, the simplest example, so. Be brave. So I'll, I'll give you a, a, a very simple. David, we just lost your audio. Oh, it went. Sorry. Uh, oh, you're back. Okay. So backslash D will match any uh, any number, uh, and so if we've got three numbers, we could just do this, or we can say. We want to match three numbers. So who wants to give have a go matching this? And I will nominate Scott. So you feel free to type it out in. Uh, it's been a while since I've done this. Um... And I'm happy to give uh, clues if you need, need something. I'll give you another clue for a space. Um, we can do a backslash S. So that will match um, three digits followed by, uh, by a space. Yeah, I think, I think you space and you do the, the digits you want, 555. And that would match the, 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 five, five, the fake area okay. code. So if we wanted to match the exact numbers, I could put that, another space, and go 555. Five, five. Right. Um, if I want to match just the pattern of digits, I can I can do again three, another space, and again backslash D and three digits. Cool. So in this example with phone numbers, there are actually lots of other options apart from regular expressions. 
because it's such a, a common a common thing to validate. So Drupal has got several modules for phone numbers. And with HTML itself, you can put in um, patterns of, of text or numbers you want to you want to put in. So you may not, with something like a phone number or an email address, you probably don't need to write your own uh, regex. It's more of an example. Um, and David, would, they, would this example, when you've just got three digits of space, three digits of space, three digits, could you do backslash D, three of those, and uh, I guess a, a, an optional space or something like that, and then wrap that whole thing in a, a you know three another uh, three uh, cardinality. Yes, you, you're probably two or three steps ahead of me. Uh oh. Um, so you can do um, do groups, and you can say this. Uh, this group is has got an optional space and you want to repeat this entire group multiple times. That's a good point. Um, so let's just, let me have a look. So there's a, I will post a few links to some useful resources. Oops. So regex is something that we don't need to use all the time, but when we do use it, it can save us um, a lot of effort. So in this particular project where we had people registering, there was a particular, particular ID number which we knew was in a certain format. And when we asked people to enter um, a number in that particular format, even though it was really clear what they had to do, it, um, sadly, um, about 10% of people chose not to enter the number in that, in that particular format. And um, people entered uh, a different ID number that that look quite similar. And so, so in the end, it's, it's, we spent more than a week cleaning up data when I could have spent maybe half an hour just getting that data right in the, in the first place. So that was just a, a very, very, very quick lightning talk on regex and I'll post the links at the end. You know, in my, in my um, data management system, we're using regex to remove a non alpha numeric uh, not you know, symbols and so forth, or commas and spaces don't belong in there, because if we're importing data from a source, if, and we all probably experience data from vendors and clients are usually horrendous. You know, they they put logos in, into Excel spreadsheets and so forth, but we're also going to try and make it at some point where the user can say, okay, here's the pattern I want, but they'll select it in the English method. And the back end will fill it in. Okay. So that's that's what we're looking to do. I don't know. If we'll, and, we'll, and once 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 I get to the point, I'll release the modules we built. But no, that's we that's a little bit in the future. That we might release because that that, that really won't um, eat away at what I'm doing. But I think that's good a good module. So the mundanes, the regular users, you know, integrators, they can go in and say, okay, here's a pattern I want to match. Um, usually I don't use it for searching. I usually use it the other way for manipulating data and cleaning things up. Or like okay. the case of your wife, she wants to ignore that. Yeah. You know, she wants to ignore something in the system, which is the same thing as cleaning up data. Cool. Thanks, Scott. Any, Any other you questions? Did. Yeah, uh, I've got a question. The, did you share the, the final regex that you used for the example with the... Okay, let me let me do that. So I will share in the, in the chat the the regex for the phone number, which was actually this is a regex for the US phone number. Let me do that first. So in later. So I might need to find the regex that I used for for this, but if I, oh, you can't see my screen. Let me share my screen. No, but you just, po you just posted in, um, in Slack. Okay, sure. Um, I haven't got with me the regex that I used to match this, uh, my wife's uh, citations, but it's something like I, I select the first bracket and I select the closing bracket and I'm, I'm, es I'm escaping the, the brackets. Uh, and then in the middle, we have a bunch of text 
which I will put as slash w, and I put a star. I think you've got um, a, a curly brace at the end. Oh, thank you. So you can see I've matched here text, but I don't want to match text. I only want to match these citations. So I, I then put in another group where I have this text. I have an optional group of dot comma uh, and then another and then some numbers at the end. So slash D. It was something like this, but it was more complicated because there were, there were quite a few examples. So I hope that's, that's helpful. Yeah, but what would you do for the word count though? Is the word count a built-in word count on something from um from you know, did you put it as a macro in micro in Microsoft Word? Or is it web page? Where was it? It was in it was a Google Doc. I wasn't Google so Doc. clever. I looked at creating a, a Google app, but I wasn't so clever. I just created a copy of the document. I did this search and replace. So removed all the citations and then did the word count. So you, so you can also stick that in Word if you turn on the developer option and you could put a macro and then you can put that in there to eliminate that in, in their count. So, so what do you do for the word count? Because that's native to the Google Docs, they have a word count? Yes, they have a, a native word count in Google Docs. And, and we also use regex when we build our scrapers. Okay. Because as it's going, find the word, find the pattern of the word price, go one one um, column or one divs, div over, two divs over, and we see the dollar sign, grab that and suck that in as the price. Cool. Thanks, Scott. And JD, if it's okay, can I um, ask the group a question which we might deal with in a future meetup? Of course. Cool. So I used to be part of a team where there was a bunch of people I could always ask questions to, but for, for quite a while I've been working to some extent my own. So sometimes I meet a challenge and, and I just don't know how to solve that. And I, I, there's a saying that if, um, if all you've got a, is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. And sometimes I'm, I meet a problem and I'm more comfortable with JavaScript sometimes. So I find a solution that's outside of Drupal and do some weird work around. So let me show you an example. So I have a, a, a site where we've got a lot of resources and some of the main function, we've got about um, 2000 resources and we've got a taxonomy of resources. So there are two levels of the taxonomy. And so I wanted users to be able to drill down, see the first level of categories, which we've got here. Um, they click on that first level and then they see a second level of categories. And then they can choose one of these second level categories and then they see the resources for that second level. And I didn't, as simple as that sounds, I didn't know how to do that in Drupal. So what I ended up doing is I've embedded a React app inside Drupal, but that has, that's created some challenges with, um, with SEO. And so now I'm looking for a way that I can do that without using React and just doing that with straight, uh, with simply, uh, with, with, with just Drupal. So maybe in a future meetup, we could chat on what is the best way to do that. Well, actually, it's a good segue to our next uh, segment, which is uh, Drupal, Drupal problems. Uh, ask, ask the group. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe David, you wanna, do you wanna show that again? Sure. So I'll share my screen again. So in this segment, anybody with a, a problem, a question, uh, Something they want to ask the group, and now's the time. So the challenge is just doing a multi-level drill down where you've got categories and subcategories, and then you've got documents that are, are categorized based on that taxonomy. Um, one of the reasons React was useful was, was performance. It, it was quick, it's very quick for users to be able to drill through, but I think I've solved some of the performance issues. So I'm really happy if we can solve this just doing, doing things in Drupal. You're, you're saying is that you're having trouble speeding up the drilling down of the, the subgroups taxonomy? So like a fast. Yeah, I, don't, 
I don't know how to build views. So I can build a view that shows the top level. And I'm sure I could build a view that shows the next level as well. But having the links from one view to the next, and then having, uh, when I drill down here, showing the, the resources that match that, uh, that second level. How, yeah, how do you do that in using views? Or how do you do that in Drupal? I know Jacob just posted, you know, sorry. Well, there's, for hierarchical, in views, you can create a filter that's a hierarchical select menu. So instead of doing the click through, that's another way where it, like that, that. And I don't think that actually answers your question. Um, you can build, can, you can set paths in Drupal and set contextual arguments so they click through to each other. So you define like a whole tree. Like if you were doing blog posts, people do drill downs and blog posts where the path is broken down into year and month. Okay. So it says 2021, and then you can say 01. And you basically pass those arguments into your view and start, I think they're called, someone help me out, it's contextual arguments? Yes. Term. So if I open up the, uh, a view just so that we can see what, actually I shouldn't do this in production. Um, <laughs> and we're, we're gonna have a chance to practice our, uh, our Spanish and views here. <laughs> our, 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 vis, our vistas. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's not a good example to look. If I look at this, is this in? Okay, let me open up one that's in English. <laughs> um, so yeah, so contextual filters. So I can grab the URL. I can just grab any view. It's contextual filters. Yeah, that's I, I just found it also. We use Filters, that uh, contextuales, contextual filters. <laughs> yeah, with with hierarchical select, with hierarchical taxonomy terms, and we use this for the exact purpose. About five six years ago, for a party planning site where you could go and select musician type of musicians, how many people in the band, and drill down, and then we finally got to the end. You got to the profiles of what you were looking for. And we didn't have to build any views for that at all. I don't know if it's available. Is that available in eight also now? Or is that was, I'm assuming it should still be around. So I, <clears throat> so yeah, David, you can, you, can add, you can add contextual filters to the view and, and basically pass arguments right into the view, uh, basically yeah. pass filters into the view in the URL. Uh, and so you can then craft <clears throat> Um, you know, the correct URL so that the drill down kind of leads to the next view. Okay. So I, as long as I have my, I need to set up my URL so that they, you know, the first level, then the second level, and then the node ID of. Yeah, so one um, approach. Go ahead, Jake. No, no, yeah, exactly. You should add a contextual filter. So like, um, you, there's lots of settings to those. This is like one of the most powerful features of the views, and JD helped me out too with it, is like you can add any contextual filter and then set up like show all if this filter is blank. That's like, a, like if you're trying to do three levels, that can get really tricky. But if you're doing two levels, you can add a contextual filter that's like enter a taxonomy term. And if someone doesn't enter a taxonomy term in the URL, they see all. They get the list of all the nodes. And then they... It also supports a summary of all the taxonomy terms that you could do in the filter. Um, it's it's very powerful. I'm trying to find a blog post because it's hard to describe all this in a. Okay, know. cool. Yeah. Yeah, but I think That's, the idea is, you know, I mean, one simple approach would be if you have one view uh, where the point is it lists, you know, all of the categories, I guess, or you know, whatever they are, and then you have another view that lists the subcategories. And you have another view that lists the sub subcategories, or you know whatever the structure is. Yeah, but when, when you I might be able to combine them. You might be, be able to combine them into one. However, it looked like from the example you gave that the the visual appearance is quite different for each one. Um, and it's not to say you couldn't bundle it into one and you know adjust the the theming. Um, uh, but but it might allow you to customize the behavior for for each one by having separate views and have a contextual okay. filter. You know, and the first view is just 
just one you know, taxonomy term ID maybe, and then the next one might be two different taxonomy term IDs. And yeah, you gotta, you gotta play around with the, the settings for the contextual filters to kind of get it to do what, what you need it to. You can also have two multiple views. You like you can yeah. have a contextual filter. You you can do a lot of packing back and forth between them. And I think it makes sense in my case to use two views. Mm -hmm. That's even easier. But it says that we we built we use a, a contextual module right out of the box that did all that. Now, what, what was the name? I'm trying to remember. I could I can I'd have to go find the um the project and bring it back, spin it back up in six. I think it was contextual taxonomy views. I mean, I don't know if it was used contextual taxonomy or something like that. So I don't remember what it was. Um, and it said it allowed us to have multiple drop, most multiple level of taxonomy terms. And every time you click on that, you get all the contents because they don't need the view anymore because that's built into the functionality. And I, I can see if I can find my notes on that. So unfortunately that was, Redmine that was on another server that we never moved, migrated. So, and I do have it somewhere in my system. Just was like contextual taxonomy in the hierarchical select. It was in the hierarchical select area, I know that. Cool. So I think I've got enough now to, to yeah. drill down a bit deeper. Thank you. Thank you for that. Who else has questions, problems to be solved? This is my son, Samuel. Hi. Hey. Hello. Nice to meet you. Yeah, it's actually called a hierarchical select. And it's only a D7 version. That's why the simple hierarchical select is good. Um, I guess I might have a question. Um, it's something I ran into about two days ago. I'm not really a developer, so it's a bit difficult to judge from my end, um, but I try to help to figure out the problem. Um, it's something um, I've tried out the DANS module. It's for notification. And the point is that module has several submodules, each of it as a plugin. Um, and I had the thing that I've installed the main module and one of the submodules. Everything behaved fine, everything is good. And then I've installed at a later point another submodule of that module. And then um, at first, the interface elements in the, basically, if you install a module um, at the global settings page of that module, um, interface widget appears for that submodule on the plugin. And it has not in that case for the submodule that was installed at a later point. And also, it was impossible more or less to uninstall the module, uh, the submodule uh, afterwards, as well as reinstall it. It was just behaving odd. And there were also errors that the plugin manager doesn't knew uh, that that submodule was installed or the plugin. And as it turned out, um, it's necessary to clear the caches right after the installation if you install a submodule with the plugin at a later point. And my question is now, of course, I've researched a bit and I've taken a look at the MetaTech module, for example, which is also 
has several submodules, each with a plugin. And there, there isn't any kind of cache clear, but it behaves totally fine without any cache clearing. I'm able to install stepwise submodules without any issues like with the other module. And I was just curious, what is the reason that those two behave differently? What was the first module? Um, I'm, I'm, I could paste um, DANS, D-A-N-S-E. I paste it in, I could later on paste it also in the Slack, but my computer is too slow at the moment. Therefore, that's the faster one. It's just for the plugin a link and compared to the MetaTech module, for example. Ralph, I'm not gonna know the answer to this exactly. Um, I know, you know, some things get cached and some don't typically, you know, depending on whether it's content or config and stuff like that. But I, I will know the answer to that. But I will tell you that it was a joke a long time ago when IRC was very popular. And some, somebody would ask a question. The first response would be, did you clear your cache? <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, it's for long been a Drupal secret that uh, if something's going awry, clear your cache and see, see yeah. what happens. So I... I I don't think it's going to be odd that you've run into issues where you have to clear a cache to see something new that was just installed, um, but that's not a direct answer to your question. So, yeah, no, I'm aware of it, but the, the the odd part is just the difference that on one module it is working, on the other it is not, and that's the odd one. It it would be consistent if if each on each and every module it would behave the same way that it's necessary if you install a submodule at a later point of an already installed module then you have to clear the cache all fine but that shift Understood. and difference yeah. that's it's odd on on one end i don't know either there's a bug maybe on the dance side or um, metatech did something else and we so just try to figure out in drupal there's there's not a formal concept of a sub module right it's just a module can include other modules, but there's nothing special about them, you know, oh. as far as Drupal is concerned. Um, okay. So, so the, the pattern that you've seen is, is, I think, a more general uh, issue. It's not as specific as the submodule issue. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, it would probably take a long time to figure out the, the real reason for the discrepancy. Um, but probably it's because this, this module was not implemented perfectly. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, in, in Drupal 8, it, in general, it should be possible to install a module and not have to clear the cache, uh, you know, to have things work. Um, you know, there may be specific cases where you would need to do that um, or specific modules that maybe don't implement the things they need to implement to make sure that, you know, you don't need to do that. Okay, yeah, that's what I was going to say, is the module can implement ways to clear the cache or clear what needs to be cleared if it's introducing something new that the system needs to be aware of. So it may be worth it to, to create an, a ticket in the issue queue um, and let them know this happened because it could be a very easy adjustment for this module to correct this issue and something yeah. that meta tags already thought of and figured out. So Yeah, I already uh, created an issue in the issue queue and informed them. And um, Jürgen already asked on the support channel on the Drupal Slack and got already the recommendation for clearing the cache in that regard on a programmatic level. So it's fine, but um, I was just trying to help um, and ask around a bit um, if anybody has an idea what might be the reason um, to make it more stable and consistent, basically. Because it's just odd. I've never seen anything like that from behavior-wise. And especially from a user experience perspective, if it's not only for that module or for others happens as well in that regard, if you install at a later point, sub modules, 
containing plugins. Uh, if somebody doesn't know it all, that odd behavior is just strange. If you don't, even if you don't get a, for example, um, micro copy stating, uh, please clear the cache, for example, on installation. Of also valid for people if you are under stress and for, just forget about it. You do it as an experienced user. So did you say? Did you say that you got an error, or, or what was the issue that you? Yeah, had? I got also an occasional error that the plugin manager doesn't knew the plugin, uh, the name, um, which I've installed at a later point. I mean, the maintainer of that module, the Don, or I don't know, is that how you want to say it? The Dan? Jürgen. Yeah, he's a pretty yeah. well-versed maintainer. So yeah. I feel like things are intentional unless it was a bug. And if there's no guarantee when you install, I see that his system, his module, his sub-modules are basically doing different things. Yeah. Like there's a config module that you link to, and then there's a content and there's a form. It's quite possible that some of them just don't have configuration that needs to be updated. Just the nature of what it's doing, that it would just behave differently. Um, uh, yeah, so I wouldn't be surprised by that. Sometimes you install a sub module and it's literally just a plugin. And sometimes you install it and there's a configuration page and it just depends. Um, and you don't know until you install it. All of them look like you can uninstall them. I just want to be clear. Um, the only way you can't uninstall modules is if you get cross dependency, where two modules get installed and they depend on each other and they can't they can't get uninstalled. And that's really hard to do. I don't know if Core catches that mistake. Okay. I hope that helps. I'll forward it. <laughs> Jake, I've never, I've never encountered that before, but now I'm going to be on the lookout. <laughs> well, anyone who's done it, it's like I just blew up my machine. <laughs> now I can't get this off. This looks like a well-maintained module. I mean, it has very small usage, 22 sites, but he's been around for a long time. Yeah. And he's very active and responsive and just try to help him a bit and ask him further. Yeah. But, uh, he got already a recommendation about the cache clear, so it will fix it definitely that way. But I was just curious uh, about the difference in the different behavior with the meta tag. That's just odd, therefore, that struck me. All right, does anybody else have a, a question or problem they want to ask the group? Thank you. My life has uh, recently been very complicated due to copying and pasting from Word and WYSIWYGS, which was a topic I haven't re-researched for a year or so. So I went down that rabbit hole again to see what tricks to the trades are out there. And um, the answer was kind of, well, you know, CK Editor has a built-in uh, function to clean the, the Word, and that's basically as good as it's going to get, which isn't good enough for me. <laughs> but that's where my research ended. So I just, I don't know if this is a question or a gripe session, uh, but if anybody's ever pulled any tricks about pasting from Word into WYSIWYG, I'm all ears. I, I always copy into Notepad. That's what I tell my team. And I then, then I'll, I'll send all their complaints to you now, Scott, because yeah. cause, cause they'll fill my inbox when I oh, say that. So no. that's what I'm today. Yeah, yeah. I said, when in doubt, copy to, to Notepad or text editor. And she was copying from one Drupal page to another, and for some reason they were getting um blank spaces. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what's causing it. Breaking spaces. Yeah, yeah. non breaking spaces. I have no idea what caused that. It makes no sense to me. But to me, the easiest way is drop it in there, notepad, get rid of any crap that's in there. Yeah, they hate that. I ended up I created a new text fil uh yeah text filter that's very restrictive, and so it's kind of like. Change the WYSIWYG to this super restrictive text filter, paste in the word, then I could strip out spans and, but I, I haven't figured out how to strip out non-breaking spaces. That's one that's haunting me. Um, and so that's my solution now. And that gets the, you know, kicks the can way down the road, but it is not perfect. Um, well, we actually, I used to, we, 
I was going to say, I use CK Editor to clean up my Word doc. Like I do like my blogs in Google Docs. And then I have this website where it does not like Google Docs for cut and paste. I cut and paste everything into a CK Editor, like their demo. Mm -hmm. And it strips out so much and gets it as clean as possible that it's good enough. This... And then I usually just cut and paste that into the, the third-party software. So I like CK Editor's cleanup. It yeah. seems to be the most reliable. They've got a decade plus of experience cleaning up Microsoft Word and any that's kind of where I'm at. They probably it's probably as good as it's gonna get usually what they've got because yeah, that's their game. Yeah. I think the no break space they can't remove because that might be intentional. Right. It you can't you don't want to take away something if someone put five spaces in a document. Um there is a tool for Google Docs where you can strip out extra spaces. That's what oh, I yeah? yeah. And an add-on. Yeah, yeah, it just says remove multiple spaces. Yeah, but in my case, the client today, there were no breaking, there, there were no non-breaking spaces, and it put it in. I don't oh, know where they're coming from. Yeah. yeah, I see it too. All you know, it makes sense that they tried to put in two spaces or yeah. something like that. But that's not what I'm seeing either. I'm seeing non-breaking spaces in places where it should just be a space, and and other places where there is a space. And and, and the same coming from Word is to come from a Drupal text editor on the same thing to another. In the, they're just copying pages over. Mm, because gotcha. they just, yeah. When I recently had it show up in like a, a non, like a, a plain text field, like a title field, somebody copied from Word. And when it rendered on the page, it, the non breaking spaces caused, you know, that text not to break. Researched. And when you looked at it visually in the Drupal uh, admin panel, everything looked great because the non breaking spaces rendered as spaces. So you look at the title, you're like, why is that title weird? And it was only when you went through and looked in the database, or I actually looked at it in a feed and saw they were non-breaking spaces, went into that title field that's just a plain text field and put, you know, highlighted every what looked like a space, used my space bar and it fixed that issue. So crazy stuff going on. From and, and you drop it in the, plain, in the text editor on the WYSIWYG editor, but you change it to a uh, plain text, then you lose all formatting. Yeah. Well, and what I was just talking about, I'm not talking, I'm talking about like just using a text field where, yeah, or, yeah you're not even allowed to use text, uh, text fields. <laughs> I'm mixing up terms here, apparently, but I'm talking about a field in Drupal where you don't have the WYSIWYG, where you're not yeah. allowing any type of markup. Yeah. But, um, and it's anyway. in the code. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Jed, in my uh, WYSIWYG, I've actually got a button that says, I'm using the standard Drupal WYSIWYG. Mm -hmm. I think that's CK Editor. There, yes. there is actually a button called Paste from Word. Yeah, and if, yeah. if you click on it, it'll tell you you have to use your command V to paste okay. because of browser security. And, and when you do that, you'll even get an alert sometimes that's like, hey, we're about to clean up this content. And you say, great. And, but I'm still finding you know a lot of things getting through that I wish were not. So, and you know, Really, this is not a CK editor issue or a Drupal issue. This is a Microsoft Word issue, but you know, I don't think they're going to change. So, but yeah, okay. Well, thanks, guys. I'm done. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> thanks, Jay. Love the, the, the punctuation at the end. Oh, yeah, I'm going to go with the Vegas. Like, yeah, uh, I'm going to do the Vegas one also. The dealers clap their hands. So no, 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 no chips up your shoes. That's right. So I thought I thought we'd uh, I thought we'd move on to the last last piece of our program, which is to brainstorm um, <clears throat> what we want to do with DrupalNYC.org. Um, so I set up a Google Doc, which I'll send in the uh, Slack channel here. <clears throat> it is empty, <laughs> and uh, I invite you all to. Uh, to log into the doc and you can can add some stuff here. But <clears throat> basically, DrupalNYC.org has been around for a while, but uh, hasn't gotten a lot of love recently. Um, and there's certain things that you know we know we need to do for the nonprofit, like we need to have you know our minutes and we need to have listing of the directors. And uh, but then there's there's more the program side of things, right? So there's um, the meetups, the lunch and learns, and any other Drupal NYC programs we have. And then there's community, right? So Drupal NYC is a community. Um, and, uh, you know, there may be some things that we want to do to highlight that or to, uh, to facilitate, you know, better community. Uh, so I thought I'd just open it up for anyone to 
uh, throw in any ideas they have, um, thoughts they have, suggestions, and uh, you know we can see where it goes. And I will also share my screen so everybody can see the uh, the document here. <clears throat> well, clearly we should have a a uh, job posting or skill selects, you know, under profiles, so we can help each other get work or be employed. It needs to have some moderation so we don't get drive by people not in our community. So job board? Job board and and profile with skills. So you can post what you're doing. So if someone's looking for somebody, they can find someone in our community. Yeah. What I would about, also add uh, if you do profiles with skills, you know, you could have anybody that considers herself a member of group one YC or has come to a meetup is be, ha, can have a profile with skills. But what happens if you did like a, like a last meetup guest book or something like some way to like encourage people to come to the meetups. So like that highlights your profile for 30 days until the next meetup. Um, I don't know. Just something like that. No, that's a good idea. We definitely had discussed that before. Okay. How to, let, so like how a, to make sure it's tracking. It's, yeah. Like a, yeah. Guest book or something. <laughs> The other thing would be is I need a module or I need help with building a module or something else. You know, so the, you know, someone wants to build a module, get stuck on something, you know, maybe they get some help. You know, assistance, assistance needed, some guidance, some mentoring. You know, no one expects you to, the, the people to do the work or I'm stuck. So uh, mentoring facilitation. Yes, and that, that can do a lot of aspects, like what module can I use to do this? You know, um, I would add definition, a, a dictionary definition. So what is composer? So especially for newbie people coming along, it's daunting and scary. You have a composer, we have um, Lando, Lando. We have all these terms being thrown around. And I, I know, in the past, newbies come to one thing, it's way over their heads, intimidates them, they leave. Oh. Now we, we no longer have the new, we no longer have the, the newbie boffs because we have one, haven't met in person, and two, we haven't had enough newbies to really have a boff. And we really need to get more new, new newbies into the system. JD, I hope you don't mind me just adding stuff. That's 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 why the link is there. <laughs> I mean, I think I, I, I added this note of individuals new to your and organizations new to Drupal, and it's, it's trying to recognize things have changed a lot in the Drupal community where I think it's a good strategy to think about both. Um, we want to get individuals coming to the meetup, but there's also organizations that are adopting Drupal more and more. And frankly, because Drupal's quote getting more enterprisey, it's kind of worth catering to them. Um, in some way, I don't know what it might be Drupal services, it might be training for their team, especially in the NYC area. Maybe I'll just provide some actionable items for organizations, what they actually can do and provide for the Drupal community, for example. The other thing we have is we, even though we're the New York City Drupal user group, the fact is that we're kind of an international group anyhow. So, you know, we're, no matter where you're in the world, we have someone who might be able to help you. Yeah. Out of curiosity, how many people do we have in a, on our mailing list? More than 10. <laughs> <laughs> we've, got, uh, we've got about 110 on the meetup uh, list, and then we've got a total, including that number of maybe 325 or something, including folks um, who are interested in the camp, 2020 camp. Okay. Hmm. 
JD, what, and can we, so we I, find the, the old list? We used to have a list of like a thousand names. Yes, um, and, and we sent a one-time email inviting them to subscribe, but we don't want to spam people. Yeah, we should send it again. You know, once every six months is not a bad thing. Well, although although we should <laughs> ask them to, 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 to say, no, don't bother me again. The, the can the can spam laws would disagree, but <laughs> um, uh, it, I mean personally, uh, I would be displeased if an organization kept emailing me, um, you know, without my having opted into those emails. <laughs> well, they all opted in though at one point. I'm just talking about the people who tend to the camps before, who opted in to the to getting alerts about more camps. Because if you send one, people can miss that, especially if they've been out of it for a while. Sure. Well, that may be a, a discussion for our uh, yeah. camp organizer meetings. Okay. So I guess there's, there's a lot of people who might come every now and then to a meeting. Yeah, I mean, we, we used to get 125, 150 people a month. And, you know, the last time we had live meetings, it was a lot less than that. We got to get free beer. Yeah. Free beer and free pizza. And oh, beer. I mean, there's a lot more homeless people in New York City. If you put signs out there, <laughs> this, this, this could be a huge success. <laughs> oh, my God. Did, did anyone ever come up with a term for that? Like meetup hoppers or something? People are good at meetup. Well, I, just, I think that's going to start happening with the vaccines. They're giving so many freebies away. People are going to start, I've gotten the vaccine eight times. I've got baseball <laughs> tickets and free beer. And... Uh, we start oh, the, no. the, the, Drew, the Drew Salvation Army. <laughs> we'll stay outside the, stand outside the WordPress meetups and hand out flyers. Oh, you know what? I have one. Um, prominent Drupal sites, uh, sites using Drupal and NYC, organizations using Drupal and NYC. Yeah. Yep. I think that's a really using Drupal and NYC. It's a very interesting one because I would like to know. And like, you know, it's fat. trust me, knowing that the library uses Drupal was amazing for when this is like 10 years ago when I was selling Drupal to MSK because that just pushed them. Yeah. Like, yep. I I closed Drupal business by saying, have you ever gone to this site called iris.gov? Of course they have. That's Drupal. Really? And boom, now they accept Drupal. We yeah. we also can help help um people with business skills. That that's something I think a lot of us need, a lot of people out there need help on uh you know anything from how to collect money to creating, you know, promoting yourself and so forth. And we offer all this is kind of almost like a Drupal Chamber of Commerce in a, con in a concept that, you know, we, we support each other and we can help build each other up and that can help us get more, more business or more jobs or more volunteers if you need help with something or, or Neil can help people, you know, contribute back to the um, organization. Hey Neil, where where are we with uh, ability for a community site to do single sign-on with Drupal.org? Uh, the we have a call for interest for finding a contractor to uh, help us out with that. We're talking about a federated sign-on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's really few projects rolled into one, uh, but uh, yeah, that's that's made it made it into there. So it, with a client today, we we're discussing exactly that. They have numerous sites, you know, from WordPress to Wagtail to something else. And we want to try and get them a federated sign on for all those sites. Because each time they, their, their, their clientele logs into another site, they have to make another username and password. Oh, no, that's the other call for interest. But I mean, that one's also something. 
Uh, here's the actual authentication. Yeah, I was nudging Neil on the side. I think this is fascinating that the DA is doing this. It it just opens up opportunity opportunities in the community just with it's not making an assumption that some company can do this for nothing that they could you know they can give a discount rate get recognition and and not be you know i mean what the, the, they're offering thirty thousand dollars right is that the is that what we're doing okay oh okay yeah the yeah, maximum cash portion of the budget and then we could you know do blog posts and stuff to in kind benefits. Oh my God, that is so worth it for any organization. And almost I want to write a blog post just for me. I mean if you're a small organization starting out with good Drupal skills. And I mean as if you can prevent scope creep, which is really common in open source and bike shedding, um, it's such a great opportunity. Yeah and we've done a few other contracts here and there. I uh, recently, uh, like Google wanted to do, uh, have the lazy attribute on images because uh, they're, mm -hmm. they want uh, the web to be faster and use their, their stuff uh, in the web standards. And that is, Google doesn't know who, who to hire. So they, uh, they went through us and uh, I believe we went with tag one. And I, I, yeah, either that was like under the threshold for, we did some sort of search for people and, but it wasn't in this format uh, exactly. So. How, how transparent are you being about the funds being spent? I'm just curious. Like. Are, are, is the DA going to publish the invoices that whoever's doing the work and what works accomplished in the sequence? And... Uh, I don't know that we've thought that far ahead. I mean, we'll certainly do whatever's in the 990s, uh, but that won't be that level of detail uh, as far mm -hmm. as I know. Uh, since since we're a nonprofit, we have to- yeah. make... So you have to publish that then. Yeah. I guess I'm curious because of um, I'm doing that. I'm, I mentioned it earlier and nearly came in, but I'm, I'm going to do an invoice and I'm tracking all my time. And what I'm seeing is like down to five minute increments. And it's really interesting to get some metrics from that. Mm -hmm. Like how long does it take to triage an issue on Drupal.org? How long does it take to fix a bug? It's, you know, there, there's little things there that are just very, I don't know. I, I felt like it, it's good. If the more transparent you can be, the more people understand. I don't know. Even in this process, if someone comes in with some crazy request, how much time it could cost when the issue queue starts spiraling to 300 comments. Um, the messaging has, and the messaging one hasn't gotten that crazy in terms of what the expectations are. I feel like that's, yeah, that's what's good about these proposals. They're well defined. Yeah, Jacob, then that's good because very often clients, you know, why it takes so many hours to do this and you're trying to explain to them what we got to go through and they just don't get it. You know, and typically, you know, they'll say, can we do the whole way this web forms all work and the whole workflow? And can you do that by tomorrow? And we need the background change. You know, I'll mm -hmm. give you two weeks for that because clearly that's complicated. So I just had another idea here. Um, you know, should Drupal NYC have a concept of membership as a way to uh, kind of build community, um, you know, and maybe gate membership in the Drupal NYC community as like an official member, whatever that means, <clears throat> on on being a member of the the Drupal Association. I, I know. I mean, they can join the Drupal Association and or attend an. Uh, uh, online or in-person uh, events. That's not asking very much, you know, no money, they don't have to pay any dues, nothing else. You know, just be part of the community. You know, they can sit and lurk in the background. That's fine. Yeah, I would love if we can start getting more, if we get more people in, I'd certainly want to join a, a virtual meeting, you know, you know, new, 
uh, the new Drupal people. Uh, you meet for an hour or two, they ask some questions. We can share our screens, help them out, help them push them to the next level. I mean, I, I feel like coming out of COVID, one thing, I think webinars are gonna be a really good opportunity for all the meetups. Like we're gonna go back to in-person, but the, the, the opportunity, it's, I think people are gonna be more open to attending webinars as long as it provides value. Yeah, like live stream. I mean, look at like Matt Glom is doing live stream of Kim Coding, which is just amazing. Like I haven't watched it, but I just know how valuable that concept is for a junior person. To see someone that knows what they're doing in front of, on their computer coding, you, you just see patterns and how people work and you learn a lot from it. Um, I just feel like we're coming out of this. We're going to keep doing it. Or we it's an opportunity we don't want to lose. And building on that, there's ways, you know, since this is about DrupalNYC.org, uh, to like maybe we could make package this as a podcast so that it could be subscribed to through pop podcast subscription services and um, the live stream, you know, dovetails into the question of membership and how we want to control who joins the live streams, mm -hmm. but live streaming on YouTube, in addition to a private zoom or something might really grow the audience. Um, you know, I have yeah. some, the agency I worked at before my current job, I did a ton of live streaming and live stream events. I hosted a YouTube uh, show that was bi-monthly and stuff like that. So I could help out a little bit with that stuff. Cool idea. Thank you. Uh... I've got a visitor. Hey. <laughs> hi, Ramona. You want to come say hi? Come on. <laughs> no, guess not. <laughs> um, well, we are over time. Um, so I wanted to... Uh, just run through our final slides here, and then we can keep keep brainstorming uh, beyond that. Uh, but our next events, uh, Tuesday, May 18th at noon is our next Lunch and Learn. And Wednesday, June 2nd at 6 p.m. is our next evening meetup. So mark your calendars. And uh, we need speakers to actually speak at our events. Um, so uh, email speak at drupalnyc.org uh, if you are interested. And that's it. So I'm going to stop the recording. Thanks everyone for joining and um, feel free to hang out and uh, continue the discussion.